grace and peace to you from God our Father, our ever-present, our risen Lord, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Just wanted to have you hear these words again. You sang them. Maybe you reflected on them. Maybe you worshiped God with them. But here's something for, to encourage us. Neither life nor death shall ever from the Lord his children sever unto them his grace he showeth and their sorrows all he knoweth. Who are these clothed in white? And as we see Jesus up on the picture and we see the people clothed in white and as we do the children's message for today and we see fellow saints with us, and we can look at them and smile and go, oh, how nice, how cute, how precious. And then as they're looking at you and waving at you, they may not be thinking the same thing you are about them. They're, they may be blank. They may not understand. But you're being touched by their presence. And so God is touched by your presence. And hopefully, and the encouragement is, that you and I will be touched by God's presence. And later on, after we talk and after we reflect a little bit, and hopefully encouraged by the word of the Lord, that we come to the Lord's table and the Lord will further bless us with His presence and His power and His peace that He gives in us. As the Lord takes time to feed us at the table, and as we receive His body and blood, and then we, from our struggles, from our sorrow, we'll never be severed. That the promises that God gives to us from heaven reach down from the sky and touch our lips, our hands, our mouth, and we taste and see that the Lord is good. How can people not worship and celebrate and praise and give thanks? How can people not come into the Lord's house worthy, uh, lifting God's name to be worthy of praise and, and give thanks to the Lord? How, how can people come into the Lord's house as we are? Maybe not thankful, maybe not focused, maybe somewhere else on our journey, in our journey. Car batteries, how do they work? <laughs> turn to, can you give us an explanation, Cody? Mom, turn to you. Not really. <laughs> car battery, what is a car battery? A car battery, what does the car battery do? It holds an electrical charge. It holds an electrical charge. But then it uses the charge, so when you go stick your key in the ignition and you turn the key, it has an electrical charge to trip the starter, and the starter turns on the engine. And then the engine runs, it runs a belt, and that belt runs the alternator, which charges the battery, which gives electricity so you can listen, have lights, listen to the radio, have turn signals, all the electricity. And so the battery is, starts on its own with a charge, but then it starts an engine and the engine helps keeping the battery charged. What would happen to the alternator or the belt, the alternator belt, if it broke or doesn't work or slips? Well, the battery won't charge. What happens when the battery won't charge? It slowly runs well. Good. And then you go. Ah, I need a jump. So you get a jump. Oh, my car starts. Off you go. You drive. You park. You go to work. You come back. Oh, man, I got to jump it again. What happened? Oh, I got to get it fixed. Well, some of you will, some of you won't. You get it jumped again. Oh, it works again. Until you figure out, hey, Dad, yeah, my car doesn't keep starting. It keeps needing to get jumped. I think you need a new battery. Okay. So she goes to the store. They want $207 for a new battery. I didn't say it, but I thought it about swearing. 
Uh-uh. Uh you have a Walmart around there? Yeah, right across the street. Go there. She goes there. Dad, what kind of car is this? <laughs> Chevy Malibu, what year? 2010, what engine size? Open up the hood and look. She can't find it. Look in the ceiling. Oh, there it is. 2.6 liter engine. Why does he have to know all this to get a battery? <clears throat> so it works right. So she gets the battery. How long do batteries last? Five to seven? You must buy a more expensive battery than I do. <laughs> but this last battery lasted five years. Why? Why don't they last? They run out of juice. Give that boy a juicy. Give that boy a juicy box. For some reason, batteries can't keep their charge. Even though they get recharged, even though they get run down, they get recharged. For some reason, after time, depending on how expensive of a battery you buy, I don't know, does anybody buy a really expensive battery? If you do, how long do they last? Eight, ten years maybe? I don't know. Does anybody here buy an expensive battery? Evidently not. <laughs> five years. I went, oh, my car battery lasted five years. I thought that was pretty good. Five years. What happened after five years? He went to Walmart. <laughs> Bought another battery for another five years. I say that to have us look at this. How long do you last being charged? Ready, up, alive, willing, loving, kind, gracious, patient, meek. As the Beatitudes said, you know, uh, as we look at the Beatitudes, uh, when it says, you know, blessed are those who are poor in spirit, who mourn, who are meek, who hunger and thirst for righteousness, who are uh, blessed are the merciful, or pure in heart, a peacemaker. Try as we may, as believers, sooner or later, we fail. We get uncharged. It just happens. Because we live in this world because we live in tribulation. We live in a time of tribulation. Somebody hasn't asked me this in a while, but maybe people will today, is, hey pastor, uh, are we living in the last days? And my usual answer is, since Jesus died, Christ, was died and crucified and rose from the grave, and he gave the Holy Spirit to his church, we've been living in the end times. And the end times is tribulation times. How bad is tribulation? This last week, I was reading in Exodus, and in Exodus, I wanted to share with you what it said in Exodus. In, ex in the book of Exodus, God calls Moses to go to uh, his people Israel who are being enslaved by Pharaoh and the Egyptians for the last 400 years. God says it's time. He sends Moses, and Moses goes, who am I? And he goes, it's not about you, it's about me. I'm going with you now. Get going. And Aaron, can Aaron speak for me? Sure. He will be your prophet. You'll be like God to him. And he will speak what you need to say. Now go. So he goes. And he goes, well, what are people going to say? They're not going to believe me. Who, who says I sent? Who, who says that um, I was sent to you? And say, I am who I am sent you. The people will believe you. Pharaoh won't believe you though. But after a while... I will turn his hand. He will bow before you and he will cast out the people uh, out of Egypt. Now go. So he goes and he tells the people and the people are all excited. Yay! Yay! Great! Okay, we're ready. Now go tell Pharaoh. He goes and tells Pharaoh. What does Pharaoh do? Ah! Get back to work. You know what? You're going to get your own straw too. And don't decrease the limit of the number of bricks per day. 
you're kidding me. It went from bad to worse. And you know what the people did? They say, may God judge between you and me, and you and us. Because now you've made a stench in his nostrils. And now our foremen are getting beat, and they're getting hurt, and they're getting killed. And now it's, life is even worse. You've made it even worse than it was before. And so then Moses says this to God. Ah, here it is. Oh Lord, why have you done evil to this people? He actually accused God of doing evil. Why did you ever send me? For since I came to Pharaoh to speak in your name, he has done evil to this people. And you have not delivered your people at all. Can you imagine living in that time? Talk about tribulation. Here's a time God sends a deliverer to help deliver His people from a terrible life, from a bad life of slavery and bondage to hard work and labor. They hear Him and they believe, but then He goes and He asks Pharaoh to let His people go, and He says no, and He increases their suffering even more. That's tribulation. But brothers and sisters in Christ... Has not this historical event, is not this historical event being repeated today, right now? Has not God sent us a deliverer who has already delivered us from bondage and terrible, terrible conditions of slavery and labor? Has not God brought us a prophet to proclaim a year of the Lord's favor? to deliver us. And are we not still living in a time of tribulation? Which is it? Are we free or are we living in tribulation? I would say it's both. As long as we live in this world today, we're going to go through hard times and times of tribulation. But yet, the good news, the greatest news ever is God loves us and forgives us and no f- sorrow will defeat us or conquer us. No bondage, no pain, no suffering, no grief, no tragedy. And, and as we look at the God's Word today in the, in the, old, in the last book of the Bible, we, we see a description here of who are these people who are dressed and clothed in white clothing. Who are they? They're the ones who have come out of the great tribulation. They're the ones that have made themselves clean and they have washed their robes in the blood of the Lamb. They're the ones that are wearing, wearing white. And that's why a lot of pastors wear white. It is to reflect and to show what we are like in the sight of God. And in the book of Revelation, a lot of people get mixed up in understanding who are the 144,000. 144,000 from all the tribes of Israel. If you take the 12 tribes times 12, it's 144,000. It means a number of completion. It's not a literal number because right after that it just says, after, I, after this I looked and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, tribe, and people, and language. There's no way on God's green earth that we should ever believe somebody saying there's only 144,000 people being saved. It's too limiting. It's too exclusive. I read God's Word, and God's Word tells me that this number of 144 is a number of, 144,000 is a number of completion, fullness. And that we all of us, from every tribe, from every nation, from every tongue, are included. And you and I are included in a crowd of people that can't be counted. There's so many people. I love that. I'm, I'm one of a crowd that cannot be counted, and we are standing before the Lord 
And no longer are we witnesses, we are worshiping. We are praising God forever. There's going to be no more sorrow, no more tears, no more suffering, no more pain, no more persecution, no more tribulation. And we will be in a place that I cannot, we cannot describe beyond our wild imagination. I can only imagine. And now the good news is that that's something that we don't only get to look forward to or hope for. We can actually stand in it, live in it, suffer in it, die in it, be persecuted in it, be mistreated in it, rejected in it. And it won't do anything except strengthen our faith, strengthen our trust in God Almighty, our Lord and our Savior. Because God will have washed our clothes and made us white in the blood of the Lamb. I need some this week because my battery is not just a little, a lot uncharged. I can tell how long it's been since I've had the Lord's Supper. I personally don't like the schedule of two weeks of communion and then two to three weeks of not communion. And I know, and when I came here, that the, num- the reason why is because of, of uh, shift work and that if those who are working shifts, that if they worked shift work, that they wouldn't receive the Lord's Supper. I don't know how real that still is today. I would like to know because I would, if we're going to only have two communions per, per month, I would like to kind of have it a little bit more even. Personally, I like to have it a lot or all the time because I need it. I need it. I need my battery charged all the time, every day. And it's the Lord. It's Jesus It's God's Word in His Supper that does it. And I'm excited about the Red Letter Challenge. And that Red Letter Challenge is just, it's bubbling over as I talk to people and listen to people. And as as they are are challenged by their Lord and by God's Word and how to live it out in their life and how God is the one who wakes us up and says, You are my child. And he picks us up just as one of the parents deals with one of the children or Papa deals with one of his grandchildren and how we care for them and love for them. That's what God's doing. That's what God's doing. He's being our God, our Father God, and we are being his children. So today, may we remember and rejoice with those who have gone on before for us already, who are already there, who have already in God's presence. That's our presence too, that we don't need just get to look forward to, but we get to rejoice in right now. Right now. Today. That that's what we get, that's what we have right now on this side of heaven. May you and I remember and rejoice as we look forward, as we look back, And as we live today, who are these dressed in white? They've come from the great tribulation. They've been washed in the blood of the Lamb. They are dressed in white, worshiping the Lord. No more tears. No more sorrow. No more suffering. Amen? Amen. And the peace of God that passes all understanding, guard and keep our faith in Jesus Christ, our creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty. Make-